is the 11th of July, 2022. And in just two days' time, it will be the commemoration of the Salaha Puja Day. And in three days, it will be the start of the annual rains retreat, be entering into the rainy season. <clears throat> and in order for the monks to spend the rain somewhere, they need shelter. We need all of the four requisites of shelter and clothing and food and medicines. And these are necessary things for monastics. So when we ordained, and then after our ordination, the preceptor, he tells us things that we should know, knowledge that we should have. And we call the eight anusat. And so there are four prohibitions, things that we should not do at all. Uh, the first of these is engaging in sex, that this is a paragica, this is a, an offense where if a monk does that, then immediately they're no longer a monk. And the second is theft, the stealing. This is something that monastics need to be careful about. If we're going to take something or make use of something in the monastery, then we need to ask for permission first. We don't just take it by ourselves. If we do that, then that can become a hindrance within our hearts, that later on we may think back to that occasion, analyze what we did, and then suffer over that. So before we make use of any of these uh, communal belongings, we need to get permission first. And um, we shouldn't use them without getting permission. We need to be careful around that. We don't take anything which belongs to someone else, even if it's just some grass. So there's also a killing of human life. And that includes human life, which is still in the womb. So we don't uh, perform any abortions or uh, give people uh, medicine that would have that effect. And we don't recommend abortions to other people either. Because as summoners, as uh, renunciants, then we don't harm any beings. And it's very common in this world for people to harm each other, however. That we have different ethnic groups divide um, these places up into our country and your country. And before, in previous times, the people were able to stay close to one another even though they're of different ethnicities. But now, with the degeneration of sila, dhamma, of virtue, and then we harm one another, divide ourselves up into my country, your country, my ethnicity, your ethnicity, and start hating each other. And this can lead to wars, even very large wars, and lead us to killing one another. So the Buddha said that we shouldn't kill even if it's life that's in the womb. If it's any human body that has a mind, consciousness attached to it, then we shouldn't take that life. And the fourth of these things that the monks should never do is a claim, falsely claim, any uh, uttari manusa dhammas, any superior human states or superhuman states. So jhanas or deep samadhi, that we don't make any claims about that. Because if we do, then this too can uh, give rise to hindrances. If we falsely claim that I've reached jhana, then this prevents us from reaching maga and pala, the past, the fruitions. So some people, they're not so cautious about that. They think that they've experienced something and then they go telling other people, say that I've awakened to this Dhamma, I know this thing. 
There was once a monk who had、uh, studied the scriptures to a high degree, and he heard. I think it was he. He claimed that he had experienced、uh, samadhi, some jhanas, <clears throat> and another person listening, they believed this. But it turns out that that wasn't actually factual. It wasn't true. He was just talking through delusion, and later on, that monk who、uh, made those claims、uh, even went a bit crazy from that. So we need to be cautious that if we do have these states, if we've experienced them,、um, then we don't tell anyone. If we haven't experienced them, then we don't tell anyone. So Venerable Ajahn Chah was a very good example in this. There were many people who wanted him to be an arahant. All his disciples wanted him to be an arahant, but he himself said that I am not anything. That if I am something, then I will suffer. But it was really a short teaching. He said, "I am not anything, and there is nothing for me to be." That we don't practice to become arahants. We practice to abandon our attachments, because if I am this or I am that, then there's still me there. There's still a self there, and that's dangerous. So he said, <clears throat> "I'm not anything, and there's nothing for me to be." He didn't want to be anything. This really showed the purity of his heart. And there was one of his students. From overseas, who had previously been a monk with him and had then disrobed, and he was in America. And in America, they hold this ideal of liberty, of freedom, very highly. So he thought that arahants need to be like this: that they don't just sit or restrained with their eyes closed, but that they should be free, that they should act in this way. So this was、um, something that his disciple thought, and Ajahn Chah he could probably tell what his disciple was thinking. So what he did is he picked up his walking stick and he poked、uh, this man with it and laughed, showing the freedom that was there in his heart. And so his disciple、uh, believed in that, believed that. Uh, he must be an arahant for sure. So for us, if we don't have any of these states, if we haven't experienced them, but we make those claims, then that's a great danger to us. So we need to be very cautious. The four requisites that are provided to us, we should always be contemplating these. That these are things that we depend upon, in order to gain seclusion, in order for us to meditate, and we use them in a way that puts down suffering and doesn't bring up new suffering. So, like the food that we eat, we eat that in a way that doesn't give us illness, that reduces our hunger, but doesn't build up new illnesses. So, we also need to be cautious around food. So that we don't get high blood pressure, we don't get diabetes, we don't get fat. Because being fat is also an illness. So we eat in just the right amount. We don't eat too much, and we wake ourselves up through our efforts. We don't just sleep at ease, just carrying on sleeping. Because we should think that it's not easy for these dwellings that we have to be there. The, the Buddha had to build up his barami、uh, for twenty asankayas, these incalculable periods, and a hundred thousand eons, in order for us to get this dwelling. So we should reflect on that, just how difficult that is. And before, when I was. A younger monk. I was just a young monk and a bit of a foolish monk, and I was helping 
to collect some stones that were close to the Ubosta hall, uh, some stones that had been taken there for its construction. And I was doing this for half an hour, and we didn't collect all that many stones, and I was thinking, well, this is just a waste of time. So I could see how ignorance gives rise to sankharas, and this builds up a sense of self. I was thinking, well, I've been working for so long now, and um, if I was a lay person and I worked for the same amount of time, then with the money that I got, then I'd be able to buy far more stones than I've been able to collect. So this is just a waste of time. So my wisdom, it was small like this, I was foolish in this way, thinking that this was just a waste of time. But Ajahn Chah, he came, and he came to teach me, and he said, Anan, these stones, they weren't born here. And I was confused when he said that. But then I thought, well, ah, well, of course these stones weren't born here. They, they didn't come from this place. They came from somewhere else. That they weren't here before. But as time went on and I thought about that, I reflected on it, then I slowly gained a realization of what he meant. This happened little by little. As I mulled it over, as I thought about it, then I thought that in order for these stones to have come here, they needed to have used explosives um, to kind of blow up part of that mountain and then taken those stones into a vehicle and then brought them to the monastery. And in order for that to have happened, the people who offered that and offered that money needed to have faith in Ajahn Chah and faith in Buddhism. Faith in Ajahn Chah that he had practiced correctly, practiced rightly. And is it easy for that to happen? So you can look at just the stone and see that, see how difficult that was. That Ajahn Chah needed to build up his baramis and how long did that take, how much time. And he had to put his life on the line in order to get the Dhamma. And then all of the arahants uh, who have helped to preserve Buddhism, just the amount of Burmi that all of them um, have had to create uh, to bring Buddhism from the time of the Buddha to this present day. So that people now still have faith in these teachings. So that they come and support this monastery so that Buddhism has been continuous, it's come down to us. And that's also dependent on the kings of this country as well. And the present king is someone who supports Buddhism. And that's been so for all of the kings. And it's really not easy. And then it comes, or it can go right back to the Buddha, the arising of the Buddha. So for just one stone, to be there, then the Buddha had to create a lot of barami for many asankhyas, many kalpas. So you can see that when we're in our kutis, then it's nice and easy there, comfortable. But those kutis, they require stones and sand and uh, cement and steel in order for us to get this kuti, in order for us to have a bathroom. So if we just lie down and sleep at ease and just carry on doing that, that's not okay. Uh, that's papa, uh, that's kind of bad karma that we're creating. That we are given these robes, we're given food, and this is all abundant. And people come and offer these things to us. And we should think that when they make that offering, they don't want to offer those things to lazy monks. They don't want to be supporting monks who don't meditate. That they've had to give up their money, and in order to gain that money, they've had to go through so much work. They've had to um, 
kind of give their physical strength to use their sweat in order to get that. And then when we're ill, then we have medicines provided for us. We have food, clothing, dwelling, we have all of these requisites. So I've contemplated uh, before, uh, really when we're monks practicing, then it's like we're students who have taken out a student loan, or been given a loan by the government. And we need to pay that back. So if we're a student who gets given a scholarship or gets given a loan and we don't have any interest in our studies, then we just get ourselves into debt. So these four requisites, we need to contemplate them before we use them. Contemplate how they're just elements that follow the course of nature. How this body is something unattractive. And when our robes touch this body, then they become disgusting as well. Because the skin that covers our body, it's made up of cells. And these cells just have a lifetime of 30 days. So each day that passes, they degenerate. And our skin then becomes full of scum and sweat. And this leaks out of the body, it gives a bad smell to our robes. So we have to wash the things that we wear each day. And because they become dirty. So we should contemplate that, see how these bodies are really disgusting things. We look at the food that we eat, even if it's really delicious food, very expensive food, and that if we put that in our mouths and chew it and then take it out again, it doesn't have any value whatsoever. Once it's become mixed up with saliva, if we take it out, then we're not going to want to eat it again. And as bacteria, it has illnesses mixed in with it. So we shouldn't eat with delusion. And what's the food like once we've chewed it? We should think about that, not just get distracted while we're eating. Have mindfulness there while we're chewing. If we kind of lose our mindfulness and our minds start getting scattered while we're eating, then we can take out from our mouths while we're eating and just throw that away so that we regain our mindfulness. We can recite Buddha as we're chewing our food or just recite chewing, chewing. And so we contemplate in this way the requisites that we have, contemplate them before we use them. And these are a standard of practice that we use. And there's also the Indriya Sangvara Sila, the Sila of restraint of the senses. So before we weren't monks, but now we are. Now we've become monks and novices. So we need to be collected and restrained. We can't just have fun and mess about like we did when we were lay people. So that's not okay. That doesn't give faith to people who don't have faith. And it doesn't develop faith in the people who already do have faith. So we have restraint over our eyes, our ears, our nose, our tongue, our body and mind. And we do this well. All of the sights and sounds and smells, tastes, tactile sensations, thoughts that come into our mind. And there's liking and disliking towards them, but we need to contemplate so that the mind doesn't get involved in liking and disliking. And see that this place where the mind isn't given to liking and disliking, this is the place that we will see the Dhamma. And we can see that Dhamma to deeper levels, even though we may have seen it before that we have some knowledge over this path of practice, but that becomes clearer, we see with more clarity. We see that we attain to the Dhamma right here, when the mind is in a state of emptiness, and that's how it becomes purer. So we should try a lot, practice a lot, put in our efforts as monks. For the lay people, that... Throughout the day, you should try to have a lot of mindfulness, making your samadhi firm. If you don't have to work a lot, 
then you can sit in meditation for five hours a day. And today there were some lay people who came from Malaysia, uh, led by Sienma, who is an excellent supporter of the Buddhasasana. And his generosity is an incredible thing. But he also meditates as well. Each day he sits for five hours in meditation. So what about us, as monks, as novices? How many hours do we sit for? If the lay people who have families, who have a wife and children to look after, can sit for five hours, then we should sit for no less than that. It's not okay. At least we should sit for six hours and do this each day. Because if we want to really see the Dhamma, then we should train ourselves to sit in meditation, walking meditation, for six hours a day and try to do this. But it's not that we sit for six hours or sit and walk for six hours and through that time we just think here and there. That, that doesn't give us results. But we need to focus and to be intent on this meditation, on bringing our minds together, allowing them to collect into peace so that joy and happiness arises. And then wisdom can come up here. We're able to let go, able to put down our attachments. So it's the wisdom that allows us to put these things down. So there were some people who, some monks from Korea, who went to ask Lom Umpu Cha Ajahn Cha, why do we need to practice? What do we practice for? How do we practice? What are the results of our practice? So when we practice, we need to have that wisdom that allows us to let things go so that we can experience this neuroda, this cessation, so that suffering can be, uh, can come to an end. So if that neuroda arises, then tanha, craving, will cease. But if that craving comes up, then that neuroda will cease. So therefore, as monastics, both the new monks and the old monks, we need to put our efforts into this. Those who have come to ordain for three or four months, you should meditate to the best of our ability. And for the lay people as well, you should really set your hearts on this practice. Being aware that life is not a certain thing, that the days and the nights are constantly passing by, passing by. And that's how it is, isn't it? So some people see that when they do walking meditation. And they walk uh, to the end of the path and they see how that walking has already arisen and ceased already. They see arising and ceasing right there and joy can arise. Or like this talk that I'm giving, that each word arises and ceases. And also the sankharas, the mental formations about what to say, that too arises and ceases. And for the people listening, that sound also arises and ceases. So if we see that, then we see the Dhamma. So may you set your hearts on this. <laughs>